And good evening, everyone. Welcome to Arcane Radio. I'm Sean the Fork Chop Forker, joined with Lon Strickler, as always, from Phantoms and Monsters, going to bring you a great show tonight. Lon, how are you doing, my friend? Uh, keeping it real, man. Just hanging in there. Keeping it real. I feel you. I feel you. Yeah. Yeah. Been a busy week around here, around the uh, Forker and Strickler arenas. Uh, pretty much today, though, kind of picked up for you. Yeah, it did. More yeah, it did. Anything. We got a. Well, I mean, you know, we've been working this um, this whatever bipedal canine case or sightings up in central PA, uh, particularly Clearfield around that area, uh, Penfield, Penfield. You know, there's some other areas as well. But today, I got a uh, I got another sighting report from a woman in uh, Cambria County. Uh, the location is just about an hour south of Penfield, and uh, it looks promising. She saw she saw something standing, uh, you know, two legs, bipedal, uh, with dog leg, you know, the dog leg types, uh, backward knee, backward, and she said it stood about seven foot, and uh, uh, it. It sounds like a very interesting sighting. So, you know, I, I actually gave her a call tonight and talked to her a bit. Sounds legit to me. So it's another one we're going to put on the list. So that's three of them now. Uh, she actually heard Butch on uh, Darkness Radio the other night. And that's how she got the uh, the Phantoms and Monsters email address. So, she, you know, like I said, she contacted me and we're going to go from there. So I think, um, I think we're going to push up. The uh, Butch is going to push up the uh, the uh, investigation date, so I think he's going to try to be up there in about two weeks. Well, I hope he can give me a date on that. I'd like to go up and at least make an appearance and see if I could uh, investigate with him just a little bit. And I missed Butch on Darkness Radio. How was it? It was very good. Very good. Uh, yeah, he, he goes on. He's been on an hour uh, the other night, and... Uh, you know, he's, I think he's been along with Dave Schrader a couple times. So, um, and he's on something again tomorrow night. I don't know exactly what it is. Another show. He's been on, he's been getting around. So, uh, you know, people are starting to recognize him and his work, which is good. And, uh, you know, it's it kind of is favorable for us this time around. So, um, and I'm, I'm asking people, look, you know, if you see something that looks out of, you know, out of the ordinary, let us know about it. Because, um, especially this thing up central Pennsylvania, uh, these, uh, these sightings have really, they've really been interesting sightings. And, uh, it all started just, I guess it was that fall last year. And they, they all seem to be grouped in a certain general area. And, uh, and you know, that Clearfield, that Clearfield County overall has been, you know, that's been crypto gold up there. <laughs> that's all kind well, of stuff. I've been saying for a long time that uh, there's something strange going on up there. I've had some strange experiences. A lot of folks have had strange experiences. The uh, PA Bigfoot Society has been investigating Clearfield County for many years, and there's been a lot of, of uh, Bigfoot sightings up in that area. But now we're starting to get these upright canine-type creatures. Uh, we really don't have a. What did you coin them? I I don't remember the exact term. I didn't really coin much of anything. I didn't really give them much of a name yet. Uh, you know, I'm I don't even know. Yeah, pen, we can go Penfield Dogman or something the like Penfield that. Penfield Predator. But there you go. I don't know. There it just sounds scary. Yeah, but, you uh, know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I, I'll be interested to see what I'll be interested to see what um see what Ken says about tonight. Uh, you know. This this all comes on the heel of this, uh, you know, this sighting report that Stan had, Stan Gordon had, and sent to me, and uh, it just so happened that JC and, and and Jack were out there in, in Denver, that uh, that that uh, that was that Lakeview, Lakeview, uh, Lakewood, Lakewood Lichen, that sighting, you know, and they're still investigating that, and. Uh, of course, JC's up in northern Minnesota, and he's got something very similar that he's looking into. So, you know. Well, who we knows? said we said these things were starting to uh, 
these creature sightings, these creature sightings have been popping up uh, more so now than ever. And I think because we are talking about it more often and more folks, not just us here at Arcane Radio or you at Phantoms and Monsters, but Linda Godfrey, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Jay Bashon, and, and those guys have really been getting the word out about what these, you know, sightings of these creatures, even Ken Gerhardt, who's going to be on the show with us later on tonight. And if folks missed our show last week with uh, J.C. Johnson, they missed a good one. It was our first uh, Submit Your Strange Stories night. And uh, JC decided to join up uh, with us and kind of host the show with us. And what a good show it was. It was really entertaining. I think the folks liked it. Some really good stories came out of that. Uh, And and that's in the archives. They can go to uh, stitcherradio.com and search for Arcane Radio and pull that show up. And as always, you can find all our shows on uh, Stitcher Radio or go to arcaneradio.com and click on archives. We're there for you. Had to do a shameless little plug there uh, real quick. (laughs) Sometimes. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, well, I got a, some excellent feedback from the show last week. Very good feedback. It was a good show. So um, maybe that's something we'll have to, you know, we'll have to yeah, keep in the arsenal. Every once in a while, I have a, a strange story show and uh, let people call in, or we call people, and they, you know, and uh, have them uh, give us their personal stories. And you know, <laughs> the uh, the incidents we listened to. Last week were pretty cool. I mean, that was some interesting stuff. So um, yeah, I was. I thought it went real well. Yeah, I, I'm really excited to hear what Ken has to offer tonight on the piggyback of last week's show as we continue our trek into these strange, unusual uh, canine type cryptids. We've been talking about them a lot, and I can't. Uh, I'm kind of becoming obsessed with them now, Lon. Uh, yeah. We're just getting a lot of reports about these, and that's okay. I guess that's a good thing. I guess we got a couple events coming up that we're going to be talking about. We got the Hillside Manor, uh, Hillview Manor, uh, Hillcon coming up, which we'll be playing the commercial for that here later on in the show at the end of September. We've got the Mothman Festival coming up September 19th and 20th at Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Uh, Ken Gerhard's going to be there. Uh, I believe Lyle Blackburn's going to be there. A bunch of your favorite cryptozoologists and, and Mothman uh, celebrities will be there. Myself and James Baker, former member of uh, the Beyond the Edge radio crew with us over there uh, with the bake shop. He's going to be going down with me. We're going to hang out and uh, uh, see, what's, see what all the fuss is about down there at the Mothman Festival. I've never been to one, but I'm really excited. And uh, just a story in the lore of the Mothman. Really cool, really exciting stuff, and I'm going to be glad to go down and partake partake in the festivities down there and report back with some good uh, some good stuff. Well, it's my favorite cryptid, as you know, and uh, it's always fascinating me. I mean, I've been doing this now for over 30 years, and it's always been the one that's kind of stuck in my crawl. That you know, it is it really a cryptid or is it you know, is it alien or what 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 is it you know, and uh, you know, I've been investigating now this, these uh, these Kahnawaga phantom sightings, and there's a couple other people that are locally up in Pen- – well, this is up in uh, Adams County, Pennsylvania. And uh, there's other people looking into that uh, phenomenon as well. And, you know, from the reports, it seems to be a, something similar to a, uh, to a Mothman. So, you know, I saw it. I saw it back in 88. I don't know what it was, but, you know from the descriptions that others have, you know, the descriptions that others people have had with the Mothman, I'd say it's a good possibility. It may be something very similar. So who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Indeed. I mean, it's, uh, you still got me there one. Yeah. Okay. This is the desktop froze up a minute. We'll, we'll just, go, we'll go past that. That's all right. As long as you can hear me, we're fine. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, these things a little bit later on the show with Ken, which I'm, I'm really excited about. Uh, man, I hate technical difficulties. We'll move past it. <laughs> you it, know, it, I, I got something else here. You know, this is a I, I got something else I got from somebody in Pennsylvania. Uh, well, actually, they don't live in Pennsylvania anymore, but this is something that happened there 50 years ago. And I tell you, you know, it's an old report, you know, but it came to me fresh because, uh, I guess the person decided they finally wanted to talk about it. And, you know, we get a lot of those. Uh, but it, it's very interesting. Uh, they were not specific about the location. I have, got an, I have got an indication, though, that it was somewhere near uh, Clearfield County in that area around there. 
So let's, uh, you know, I posted this on the website a while back, but I'm going to go ahead and read it because it's just so weird. Uh, the incident I'm about to relate happened some 50 years ago. I was visiting my grandparents who lived in an old farmhouse in central Pennsylvania. My cousin, my cousin D uh, was there as well. We rose super early each morning as was the practice when visiting there. My grandma, who those that did not get out of the house before breakfast at my grandma's, those who did not get out of the house before breakfast, got a chore list that would take all morning. So uh, Dave, D, and I were uh, determined to avoid that list. Uh, the house stood on top of a hill and was some distance from the road with a long drive leading up to a car park area. The, uh, the ground on either side of the driveway could best be classified as an untended meadow with cops of trees sporadically scattered throughout. Now from the car park in front of the house, you can look down out toward the road some 500 yards away. This is where Dave and I stood that morning. Now there was a small stand of pine trees about halfway down the hill. These were young trees, not more than nine foot tall. We knew these trees well as they were the impediment to every hill roll or sled run uh, we ever attempted down the slope. Uh, today, however, we never even got to start the downhill fun. Uh, what the hell was that? One one of us asked, and you know the other one said, "Well, what beats the hell out of me?" Actually, you know, it, it was something was under near the nearest pine tree. Uh, it was actually a figure. It appeared to be made of golden metal, which glittered in the sunlight. It was about three foot tall, as best as we could determine from the uphill angle. From the shoulders down, it seemed to be wrapped or swaddled in golden cloth. This extended the entire length of the creature, making it look as though it was a form-fitted sleeping bag. On its head was a helmet or headdress, also gold. When we first saw it, it was facing to our left, so we were looking at its golden left profile. The sight of this thing made us both freeze in place, barely breathing. We started down at it for a time distorted period, maybe a minute. Suddenly the thing changed its head, changed its head. It did not turn its head. It had been looking straight ahead at a spot somewhere to our left. Then it was looking directly at us. The head did not move. Though all the inner, you know, through all the intermediate positions, the transformation was instant. But then a wave of dread and terror rolled over the two of us. I have never before or since felt anything so intensely alien and malignant. I hate it hated us. Neither of us were the the most athletic kids, but I beat Dave over the fence by a good four foot. Apparently we burst into the kitchen babbling incoherently about a golden boy down the hill. It took us a good half hour to convince Grandpa that the Roy would be something worth seeing if he went out with us. And, of course, there there wasn't. Nothing on the ground, nothing under the tree, near the tree. Uh, but that image of a golden boy with the most intense nastiness in its gaze, that would never go away. Now, I use the term golden boy as that is how the family story has evolved. But it was no boy. It was a humanoid, as best as the distance would reveal. But that sense of malice and dread made it impossible to stick around for more details. Uh, in, in the 50 years since, I've never heard or read a similar encounter. Has the golden boy ever crossed your path? He's asking me. Uh, well, has it? Well, no, I mean, and it's, you know, I, I have had, um, I have seen or heard of, uh, I've seen pictures of similar type, I guess, beings, but I've never heard of being gold. Most of them are like wrapped in white or some type of, uh, light colored material, but, and they, you know, they, they float around. It's nothing that sits stationary and nothing where, a head or any part of it would uh, would transform 
or shape shift somehow. So I don't know what they ran into. Uh, but um, I thought that was quite interesting. Now I looked at the, you know, they gave me a shot from Google Earth. They didn't give me a location or anything. And, uh, you know, the, the, the landscape has changed. It's mostly the hillside is mostly grown up with trees now. But, um, you know, that that's just an odd story. And uh, I thought it, I thought it was worth mentioning. Uh, yeah, it's really strange. Especially, you know, it might be. I kind of think it's maybe around Clearfield County, maybe a little east of there. But it's just something else that happens up there. You know, <laughs> we hear all kinds of stories that come from the area. Now, you think these feelings of malice and dread that are often associated with the unknown uh, entities that are being seen by these people, do you think they're actually systemic of, you know, just experiencing something new and out of this world and frightening? Or do you think it's something that really comes from the, the, the being? Like, is it really emitting this, you know aura that just makes you feel like, oh, this is not a good thing. Does that make any sense to you what I'm asking? Yeah, yeah, I think it's kinetic. I think, um, you know, some would say, well, maybe it's ESP or maybe they're, you know, thought projection or something like that. Yeah, I think it's kinetic somehow. I, I don't think it's just that they're scared. Uh, you know, normally when somebody's scared, they either freeze up or they kind of lose focus on what's going on um in these instances and you hear a lot of times in these instances it's like you know they can feel actual fear or dread coming from the being itself and uh you know they can actually tell what kind of emotions if it does have emotions it, it's projecting or that it's actually feeling yeah it's like you're being an empath in a way i, th I think that does happen you know, I know it happens in, in, in you know, spirit wise, you know, people that are in past can, you know, tell how a spirit feels uh, under certain situations, uh, if the vibrations are correct. But I don't think it's much different when you're talking about one of these beings. We often talk about this stuff and. Uh, you know, when we're talking about Bigfoot research and is it a pheromonal reaction? Is it a infrasonic reaction? You know, what causes this feeling of malice and dread? And it's not always associated with the creature by everyone. You know, it's really boils down to the individual. So I wonder if it's not more of a psychological effect than a physiological effect. And, you know, is there is there something more to it? Like you said, it happens, you know, in spiritual encounters. I just don't know. It just popped into my mind. I thought I'd ask. Lawn. And we're bringing Lon back onto the program, so bear with us. Yeah, I'm here. Hey, there you go. Welcome back, big guy. Yeah, my uh, my Skype took a dive. Welcome to the 21st <laughs> century and the uh, great means of communication that we have. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, I had a good question for you there, but in the interest of saving time, uh, we'll just save it for another day. Uh, good story though. The golden boy, kind of a strange, uh, I hadn't heard of this story before. So something different to share with the audience. Yeah. It was, you know, I just wanted to bring it up. I had it sitting in the, um, I had it sitting in my show notes for a while and, you know, things happen. We just don't get to it, but I wanted to, I, I did want to get to it. So, um, yeah. So I, you know, I don't know. I really didn't pick out anything else to, to talk about tonight. Uh, you know, that's, you know, I'm glad Ken is going to be on with us after we did have a cancellation with Ken, unfortunately. What was that, three weeks ago? Yeah, it's and, been a couple of weeks now since uh, since we had to cancel. And before that, we had to reschedule him. And it always seems that when we're, we're going to talk about uh, having Ken on the show, something happens. So we didn't promote the show with Ken until like yesterday. I think, yeah, I think it actually <laughs> happened over a BTE one time as well. So, um, but. You know, he was gracious enough to, uh, you know, answer my inquiry if he'd come back, and uh, he's with us tonight. So uh, yeah, it's a good time. We're gonna have a good interview. time. And you know, of course, he's doing that. He's doing this new show on the History Channel, um, uh, Missing in Alaska. Oh, That's I, good. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I. I don't know if I'd have the guts to do that. Uh, you know, you're out there in the middle of nowhere, and uh, 
Now, of course, you got cameramen and all that there, too. But, you know, I, I like the way the show's done. And uh, you and I were talking about it before we came on. And I, I think it's everything's explained very well. I think it's been about three episodes now. Uh, I think it's gonna they're going to restart with the new episodes very soon. Well, I hope so. I just spent twenty four ninety nine to buy it on Amazon Instant because I'm tired of trying to find it on the television <laughs> dial. Like it I am. Fine, yeah, it is hard to find. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to this. I I got a few questions for him, but maybe Ken can answer some of this dog man bipedal canine sightings. Maybe he can answer some of those questions for us. I hope so. I mean, a good show so far. I like the production quality of it. It kind of has the same feel to it uh, in terms of production quality as uh, M2M or M squared. <laughs> you know, Monsters in it. That's that's a great show. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, it is. And I, I think the production quality like that makes a big difference. It, it captures my eye and uh, keeps me entertained. And I think as much as we like try to purify what's going on and keep it as true to cryptozoology and true to the facts as possible, I think a little dramatic flair has to happen to make it uh, appeal to a wider audience. We all know this, mm -hmm. talk about it often. But it still appeals to me because sometimes what we do is boring. I just had this conversation with some coworkers today talking about tonight's show. And, you know, everybody thinks that, uh, you know, paranormal investigators, cryptozoologists, that every time they go out there, something exciting happens. But, Lon, you know, well as, know as well as I do that that's not the case, that sometimes it's boring. And uh, that if we were to chronicle everything we do uh, 24 hours a day, I think the film crew would get bored with us and walk away. So we have to keep it fresh. We have to keep it exciting. And I think even though these shows are as accurate as possible, still adding some dramatic flair, at least missing in Alaska has been pretty cool so far. I really like it. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I did enjoy it. Uh, this whole phenomena, the, uh, that triangle, the Alaskan triangle, uh, that kind of stuff really fascinates me because, because we know, of course we've got these, these hot zones worldwide. And, um, you know, some particular hot zones just seem to manifest some really weird phenomena and also a lot of disappearances, uh, you know, in, you know, just like the Bermuda Triangle and some of these uh, vortice areas that are, you know, are said to be able, you know, that have these type of uh, these type of uh, missing people going, miss people disappearing and such. So. Uh, this is something the same. I think there, you know, this area, and in particular the area of Mount Hayes, um, is which they've been investigating, has just really something's going on. And you know, they've they've got this theory. And I'll, I'll let Ken tell you, but overall, I, it, it's like there's maybe something underneath the area that's causing these disappearances because he's coming up with all kinds of anomalies as far as a. Uh, uh, magnetic and electronic and a lot of ufo activity so i tell you what why don't we um why don't we go ahead and, and take off take off here just take our break and we'll go ahead and call ken and uh you know not delay this any further and bring him on with us well let's get it on we'll go ahead bring ken on during the break here get ready to go folks uh stick around arcane radio sean forker lon strickler We'll be back right after a brief break. We'll give you a little commercial here and a little tune to tickle your fancy. Smoke them if you got them. Do whatever you got to do. We'll be right back. Back, folks. Arcane Radio. Sean Forker, Lon Strickler, joined tonight by Ken Gerhardt. And before we bring Ken on the show, just a little bit about Ken. Ken is a widely recognized cryptozoologist and field investigator for the Center of Fordian Zoology, as well as a fellow of the Pangaea Institute and consultant for several anomalous research organizations. He has traveled the world searching for evidence of mysterious animals and legendary beasts, including Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, the Chupacabra, uh, enigmatic winged creatures, and even werewolves. In addition to co-hosting the new History Channel TV series, Missing in Alaska, Ken has appeared in three episodes of the television series Monster Quest, and is featured in the History Channel special, The Real Wolf Man, as well as Legend Hunters for the Travel Channel, Unexplained Files on the Science Channel, Paranatural, National Geographic, Weird or What with William Shatner on Sci-Fi, Monsters and Mysteries in America, True Supernatural, Monsters and Mysteries in America again on Destination America, 
Ultimate Encounters, The Monster Project, and Shipping Wars, uh, as well as being on Coast to Coast AM and other various uh, podcasts, internet radio shows, and uh, all over the Associated Press, Houston Chronicle, and the Tampa Tribune. He's also the author of the books Big Bird, Modern Sightings of Flying Monsters, and Encounters with Flying Humanoids. And Ken, welcome to the show tonight. Your first time on Arcane Radio, and the first time we didn't have to cancel on you. Well, we, we finally got it together, didn't we? Yes, we so did. that, 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 was, that was awesome, and I, I hear everything turned out okay um, as far as uh, the last time, so I was very happy to hear that um, as far as on your end. Um, but, yeah, it's great to be here. It's uh, good to be here, a uh, fan of the show, and I'm um, ready to talk about cryptids and other weird creatures. Well, we got some cryptids to talk about. Lon's been chasing one up here in Pennsylvania, and I'm sure he'll get to that in a little bit. But go ahead, Lon. I know you're chomping at the bit. Well, you know, I, I, I'm sure uh, I'm sure Ken knows what I'm talking about. These dog men are, well, you know, I don't even want to call dog men, but these lichen or bipedal uh, canine sightings that have been popping up. Yeah. Well, a lot of different places, and you, you know what's been going on. What, what's your what's your assessment on this, Ken? Well, it, you know it's interesting, Ron. You know, obviously, uh, Linda Godfrey. Uh, you mentioned, you know, she's been documenting it for decades, and she's really done more than anyone else in terms of showing that there's been a consistent pattern of sightings that go back a ways. But you're right; it does seem like we're getting a lot more sightings lately. And uh, you know, you you can't discount the uh, the human factor, which is uh, you know, is it the fact that we're basically more in tune with this dogman phenomenon now that we are hearing about more sightings, more people are aware of it, maybe more people are coming out of the closet with their sightings because there's a climate for that. Um, you know, or is it, you know, one of those kind of Keelian things where you've got different waves of, or time periods where there seem to be, uh, you know, occurrences of weirdness and, and strange things going on more than usual, uh, so to speak. Um, you know, so it's, you know, it's hard to say, but uh, I think the awareness is a good thing because it, it seems like there's definitely something behind this, the sightings. I mean, uh, from what I understand, you know, the eyewitnesses are, are clearly describing something that's not your traditional Bigfoot or Sasquatch. I mean, it's, you know, like, like you said, a bipedal canine, you know, an elongated snout and uh, presumably a long bushy tail and, you know, other canine features. So it's, it's pretty weird. Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, we're... And we're going to be investigating, well, uh, Butch and some others are going to be, um, Butch Wachowski is going to be investigating uh, the boots on the ground in about two weeks, he told me tonight. So, uh, you know, they're going to be coming up there and I'm, you know, I'm digging for sightings in the general area. Uh, But yeah, I, you know, I had this, this one sighting that was reported to me by, um, by Stan Gordon and sent to me from him uh, about that sighting in Lakewood just outside of uh, Denver. And, right. you know, we have no idea what that is, though JC kind of believes that it is an actual being. Uh, and just because of the topography and some of the, you know, the ability for this thing to be able to survive with food and shelter and everything in that area. Um, now, and of course, you know, Pennsylvania is the same way. And some of these other sightings, that have been a lot of them mostly in southern Ontario, Manitoba, Alberta. You know, these are areas that are, you know, thickly forested and have a lot of game available to, you know, to these creatures. So, um, yeah, I'm not kind of, I'm not surprised that just think people are actually making reports. It's just that, you know, now we're getting a whole slew of them. And, uh, you know, it, it is fascinating. So, uh, you know, I don't have many of these type of creatures. I, I know you've done some werewolf research, but yeah. uh, how many you've, you know, if you've, and you've done most of your work down in the southwest area, down in Texas and Mexico. Uh, That's uh, true. You, and, you know, uh, along those lines, I do have a, con- sorry to interrupt, Lon, but I do have a contact in South America down in Brazil who's been investigating there. And, uh, just like up here, they have kind of this increased occurrence of what they call the Lobazon, which is basically mm-hmm. a, a, a werewolf or a dog man. And he's sending me new reports all the time. So it's specifically uh, parts of Brazil and Argentina. So it seems to be concurrent with what's going on up here in, the, in North America. Oh, that's interesting. 
Well, let's talk about missing in Alaska. How did you get drawn into missing in Alaska? <laughs> well, uh, thanks for <laughs> thanks for putting it so delicately. Um, you know, I'll be honest with you, Lon. I've been you know for the past several years, I've been involved in several uh, attempts to pitch uh, a cryptozoology or or you know otherwise uh, paranormal based type show. Uh, to major networks, and uh, it's a tough sell in some levels. You know, there have been a few that have broken through and done really well. Obviously, uh, the Ghost Hunters, the original Ghost Hunters show, and uh, uh, Finding Bigfoot's been doing well, and, you know, River Monsters and certain shows like that that have, you know, a little bit more of a, you know, a different spin. But uh, it's been tough kind of kind of selling different ideas, and, you know, it's, it's, weird. it's a weird business, first of all, as you, could, as you might imagine. So you have, like, these... Uh, kind of conflicting attitudes. Like sometimes people are like, well, they're afraid to take chances and try new things. But on the other hand, it's like, you know, they're afraid to stick with new, the, the same old thing. They have to try new thing. You know, it's like they never know exactly what they want. But uh, bottom line is, uh, you know, eventually uh, a production company contacted me and said, you know, we have an idea that's on the next level, which means that the, the network is going to buy it. And, um, they had, you know, first thing they mentioned was Alaska, and I was pretty much sold at that point because Alaska has been on my bucket list forever. I mean, talk mm -hmm. about a place with, with tons of potential in terms of just, you know, area, wilderness area, habitat, and, you know, and so forth, kind of the last frontier. And, um, you know, moreover, they, um, they seem to, they, you know, they said they wanted to do something a little bit more scientific in terms of presenting the viewer with lots of information and, uh, you know, maybe doing some recreations and some dramatic things for, you know, uh, to kind of build it up a little bit. But um, uh, so anyways, that was it. And, uh, you know, it, it was kind of a whirlwind. I think they had picked out another guy uh, before me and for whatever reason he couldn't do it. So uh, I was the second, <laughs> I was the clear second or third choice, whatever. <laughs> I was on the list. Oh, my. And, uh, <laughs> no, anyways, um, it's a great show, man. Um, I, I've made fast friends. Um, the three of us on the team we never met before the show. They kind of brought us all together. But Jack is a private investigator from Arizona, and uh, he's a <clears throat> kind of more of a, a kind of a skeptical, kind of by the numbers kind of guy. But he's he's open minded. And uh, then there's Tommy. Tommy Joseph is a famous uh, native carver up there. He's a cleaning it and um, cleaning it people, and he is a uh, famous carver of totem poles, but he's also, he knows a lot about the legends and, and you know, the lay of the land in Alaska. So they kind of just put us together and gave us a list of, uh, of mysteries to investigate. And obviously all of the, uh, the mysteries that we investigate are also tied to, tied to the, the greater mystery, which is why are there so many missing people in Alaska uh, mm -hmm. in relation to, you know, other places in the United States. Um, I forget the, you know, I've heard so many different versions of the statistics, but you know, essentially it's like two out of every thousand people go missing or something like that every year. So That's a lot of missing uh, people. It's, it's pretty mind boggling, you know, and, uh, you know, of course many of them are found, you know, there are a number of reasons, hazardous reasons why Alaska could, uh, you know, could be a treacherous place, inclement weather, dangerous beasts, uh, you know, mountains and, uh, you know, glaciers and all kinds of things. So, um, but you know, that's it basically. So, uh, you know, I think the, the network liked the idea that was in Alaska because obviously Alaska is very popular right now in television world. Uh, they liked the fact that we were going to diversify our portfolio and cover a range of topics. And, um, you know, ultimately they, uh, they wanted to do some of the crypto stuff and this gave us a chance to, to do some, ep some episodes. And I think mm. that's the re refreshing thing about the show is that you are tackling more than just some cryptozoological topics. You've got a wide range of topics that you're covering and you're going to cover but just because i just watched the episode on the hairy hairy man what was the uh i guess the story that stood out the most for you that's like man there there's got to be something to this hairy man in alaska well um you know they didn't really unfortunately didn't didn't get uh a lot of dr robert alley into the episode but uh he is the uh, Alaska's foremost expert on the Sasquatch. Brilliant guy. Um, he wrote has Rain. Done just loads of research. I'm sorry. He wrote Raincoat Sasquatch, right? Raincoat Sasquatch, and he's got That's a right. second book that uh, that he's about to release. And uh, I mean, he's an anthropology uh, 
He's an anthropologist, but he also is an expert in linguists and uh, or linguistics and different things. So anyways, but he he just gave me a lot of information when we, we spent a lot of time together and just you know sharing a lot of the accounts that he'd collected. Um, you know, there's so many different native names for the hairy man up there. Uh, there's uh, the Kushtika and the Aruvatak and Urakule and um, uh, Nantina, Gaget. So they all basically mean the same thing, which is big, wild, hairy man that lives out in the woods. So, I mean, it's pretty obvious what all these different cultures are talking about. So, I mean, you know, the other thing that's really compelling, I think, is that, uh, you know, Alaska is right there in terms of, you know, there was a land bridge that connected Asia and North America, obviously, uh, back during the last uh, ice age, probably about up to 11,000 years ago or so. So there were a lot of different things coming over here from Asia in terms of different animal species. We know that for a fact. So, um, you know, why not something from Asia that, you know, walked on two legs and was more of the, you know, the hominoid family. I mean, that's perfectly plausible. That's, we know there's a lot of fossils. You know, I had, I had heard the, uh, the tales coming out of the Kanai Peninsula uh, for years, but, you know, this hairy man phenomena seems to be in different areas in Alaska, doesn't it? We dropped him. We'll get him back here real quick. Okay. You know, gotta love our Skype. When we find something better that works, we'll use it. <laughs> <laughs> it was just getting good. Come on. Folks, if you ever thought about becoming a uh, podcast host, don't. This is the anticlimactic part of what we do. So anyhow, he was talking about Rainco Sasquatch, or uh, Dr. Robert Alley, and I recognized the name from the book Rainco Sasquatch, and it's one I've been trying to get a ha- my hands on for some time, Lon, and I haven't been able to get my hands on it because it's been selling at a pretty ridiculous price. Yeah, it is. It's not cheap. I've been advertising it for a while now, and uh, it, it is. I don't know if you can find a second one somewhere or not, but. You know, go figure. Every time. It's the same thing with Bill Bean. You know, we... <laughs> Every time, yeah. Bill Bean's another one. You, you know, we just have problems with when we talk to him. Oh, we're not, I'm not giving up yet, so we'll just keep talking here until we get uh, uh, Ken back. Hmm. Figures when I ask a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyhow, as soon as we get him back on the show, I mean, we're going to get him back on the program here eventually at some point, the wonders of technology. Uh, but I guess we can keep going with what we were talking about. You know, he is talking about the, you know, what do you say, two for every 1,000 people missing in Alaska? Yeah, I've, uh, you know, I wasn't really aware of that number until several years ago when that movie, uh, uh, The Fourth Kind, is that what the name of it was? Uh, From Nome, Alaska? Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, and uh, they were talking about how many people had been missing in a gnome, and and I wasn't sure if that was actually true or not because you know of course they they kind of jack things up when you know <laughs> they kind of get the statistics uh, skewed when they're doing a movie and promoting it, but uh, you know I did hear on later that you know this about this Alaskan Triangle and. Uh, how many weird things happen there, all kinds of weather anomalies. And of course, a lot of planes that go down, a lot of people go missing. Um, it, it, it really is strange. And, uh, you know, if you, if you watch the three episodes, they do take, uh, they do take everything in account. And I'm, I'm just, I'm also talking about maybe possible alien abduction because, uh, uh, there have been sightings of uh, there have been sightings of uh, a lot of UFOs and some strange lights and a lot of st- other strange things going on. People just disappearing all of a sudden. Uh, you know, not unlike the Dalan uh, Dalan or whatever that uh, uh, the, uh, situation was over in Russia years ago. When now they did find the bodies. But you know they had no idea what happened to the day alt left pass. Yeah, they and they, uh, you know, that's an enigma nobody knows anything about. There's a lot of speculation that possibly it was a Bigfoot, or you know, it could have been, you know, a non-terrestrial incident. So 
you know, I don't know. You and your non-terrestrials. Yes, non-terrestrials. <laughs> Extraterrestrials. Multi-terrestrials. Multi-terrestrials. Uh, what was the other one? You ultra-terrestrials. Uh, ultra-terrestrials. That the ultra-terrestrials is my favorite because that's like a super-powered terrestrial. <laughs> Ultraman is an ultra-terrestrial. I got. I hope nothing happened to Ken. Well, I hope not. I mean, yeah, I'm uh, still trying. I'm not going to give up. You know me. Uh, he never knew when to quit. But we're, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're going to try to get Wait, him back his, on. His here. phone just dropped off. Is that what happened? Yeah, it just dropped off, and now I'm trying to call back, and we're not. Uh, I don't know if it's dialing out. Let me do something here. The folks are going to have to listen to me for just a second. I'm actually going to uh, just restart Skype here quick, Lon, so they're going to drop you off. Okay. Uh, too. So it might be... Uh, a pain. Yeah. But you still have me going through, folks, and as we try to make through this. But yeah, I guess one out of, uh, that's one out of every 500 people disappearing in Alaska, and I don't like those odds, because uh, I definitely would not like to go to Alaska and be one of those uh, one out of 500 people that uh, that disappear. And as while we're just talking on the subject of missing, and I'm trying to get everybody back on here, so I'm multitasking, so bear with me. Uh, David Polite sent me an email. Uh, that he is releasing a new book. He announced it over the weekend, Missing 411, a sobering coincidence. And it's his coincidence. It's his fifth book. Now I have the first three, Missing 411, and I've liked them very much. Um, I've not uh, got a chance to read the fourth to pick that up, The Devils and the Details, but the folks that have read it have given me good feedback on it, and I'm interested to see uh, what the fourth and the fifth book hold, a sobering coincidence. You can check that out by going to uh, David Pilates' website. Uh, I love adverts. I'm not going to buy your product. Just sign me in. Missing 401, a sobering coincidence. Like I said, go to his website. We'll post it in the chat room. Put it on the website, arcaneradio.com, where you can go and find it. Uh, he's also working on a, uh, I believe, a movie, Missing 411, the movie, which should be pretty interesting to see. All these, something going on here. These, uh... Missing people clusters and, and state parks and national force, national parks around uh, the United States, around the world. It's just something that's not coincidental about them. And I think we have to really uh, read what David's putting out there, do our own critical thinking, our own analysis, and, and get involved and see what's really, uh, really behind these. Is there something more sinister, something more nefarious that's causing these uh, abductions, these missing, these dis missing people, these disappearances? Are they, uh, is it something extraterrestrial? Is it something cryptozoological? Is it something that, uh, you know, uh, is it a person out there doing these things? I mean, it'd have to be a pretty busy person, but we can't rule that out either. But the Missing 401 series, definitely uh, well worth the uh, interest if you can uh, take the time to devote to reading a decent amount of information. Uh, a lot of books. I was surprised by how many uh disappearance clusters there were in my state of Pennsylvania. Very interesting to see. What were we what were we discussing? Uh, Alaska, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff to investigate up there. But yeah, we were talking about uh, how the show came to fruition. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm, ex I'm excited to announce uh, that after a brief hiatus, uh, I just learned that we will be re-airing on September 12th on History 2. So that's History Channel 2 on September 12th. And they're going to be showing the first three episodes that have already aired on History Channel in addition to four brand new episodes uh, all that day. Well, that's great. I was I was wondering when they were going to come back. But, yeah, I was, I'm was i looking forward to it. Um, you know, you you had mentioned the, the Harry Man phenomena up there. And uh, mm -hmm. I think you were on the Kenai Peninsula at one point while you were there. But I, yep. you know, that that has that's the area where I have heard a lot about this this hairy man, you know, the sightings and such. Uh, do they have any other type of weird sightings, and especially in the triangle? Um, in terms of hairy man, you mean? Yeah, yeah. There there have been uh, sightings within the triangle. You have a lot of sightings, kind of up near Fairbanks, kind of in the okay. central part. You have sightings. Um, kind of on the, the border with the Yukon as well. And that's kind of 
closer to the area that we were uh, initially investigating, the Wrangell St. Elias National Park, which is kind of up there um, east of Anchorage and I guess closer to the border with uh, Canada there. Um, you know, there's also a lot of sightings, you know, in the, in the area, out, you know, outside of the um, quote unquote triangle, you have a lot of hairy man sightings uh, down in the uh, peninsula and uh, the areas around Ketchikan and Sitka, Juneau, uh, kind of southeast Alaska, uh, which makes perfect sense, right? Because you get a whole bunch of uh, accounts down there in British Columbia uh, to the south as well. Um, now, on the show, uh, if I remember correctly, you had a, uh, you were kind of doing a stakeout. I guess that was in Kenai, the Kenai Peninsula one evening. Uh, yep. And it seemed like by you Port, guys. By Port Lock. Yeah, you it seems you got that's right, that's right. And it seems you guys uh, kind of, kind of stirred something up. Did, uh, what do you think you ran into that night? Man, there's there's really a ton, Lon. I mean, the thing is, the Kenai has one of the largest population densities in the world in terms of bears. Okay. I mean, there are bears all over the place. We found bear uh, tracks, found some scat and other signs. So you know, claw marks. So there was definitely bear activity in that area. Um, now that being said, we, you know, we didn't find definitive evidence in terms of, of a hairy man. So it's hard to say if we could have encountered, we might've encountered something else out there. I mean, it, it, it really is hard to say, but, um, you know, it's a pretty, pretty unnerving area. Like I said, you're pretty isolated out there. There's a lot of wildlife moving around. It's pretty dense brush. Um, so you know, it's true we did have a small crew with us, but um, you know, it, it it was still it was kind of a, a harrowing evening. Now, you know, that being said, the, the way that they edit and put these TV shows together, sometimes uh, they have a tendency to, to kind of amp things up a little bit even more. <laughs> you know, with music and the way they edit and cut things together and stuff. So we definitely heard some weird things. Uh, we definitely smelled something. And, um, you know, but we can't say definitively, you know, we could have very well, you know, been in uh, bear territory there and maybe, at least for my part, not really being around bears a lot. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a new experience, so to speak. Yeah. Now, I, um, I, I thought it was, imp- I thought it was intense. I thought the way they cut it was very intense. And, uh, you know, that might have been what they did kind of, like you said, amped it up a bit. But, I was I was curious of what you you thought you'd run into. Um, did you have any off air incidents that you can talk about? Um, no, I think they did a good job. They they pretty much had cameras rolling on us the whole time, so there was nothing that really happened out there that I don't think that that was interesting that they 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 caught on film. Now we did have some engaging conversation, and you know, granted, most people aren't going to probably you know maybe tune into to that type of stuff if it's if it's prolonged conversation but uh just sitting around kind of our you know on our stakeout sitting around the tent and uh, talking about all the evidence and and you know the, the potential for alaska there of course tommy being native alaskan uh his sister has actually had a sighting uh, of a sasquatch so you know that's i don't something i don't know if that, that made it on the show or not but his sister's actually had a sighting uh he you know, he'd never seen had a sighting he knew a lot of people from his uh, area that had had sightings with the hairy man as well. So, it did make it on the uh, show. Oh, that did. Yeah, I, I couldn't remember if it did or not. But um, yeah, you know, the, you know, there's just again from a scientific perspective, and uh, you know, of course, with all these monsters, as you know, long we can always take two different perspectives. We can say, well, it's kind of you know, this is a zoological uh, enigma, some some kind of creature that I discovered is running around out there, uh, or it's you know something that's more spectral in nature, you know, kind of an apparition or whatever. Um, in terms of Bigfoot or Sasquatch, I think, you know, most people that are into the unexplained understand that, that it's, it, there's a lot of physical evidence. And so that would indicate that we are dealing with some type of very large hominid, you know, that basically hasn't been discovered by science yet. And I think Alaska uh, has a lot of potential uh, to harbor something like that. We, you know, I've, I've received over the years... Uh, uh, a, a fair amount of reports in Alaska. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I think most of them are a hairy man sighting, but there are some others that are really hard to explain. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, there, of course, there's a lot of spiritual belief in, yep. uh, in nature uh, with the native uh, 
Inuits and uh but I have had some pretty strange uh, sightings as well that were I don't know what you could describe them. You know, you know, they kind of make it sound like the boogeyman that is chasing them around <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> right. But, you know, I, you know, so, some of these around some of these villages, uh, they're really dead serious about, you know, some of the uh, uh, hominid type beings that they see. And I, I actually I had a sighting from a from a witness years ago. You know, I asked him, I said, well, you know, is it a big book? Is it a Sasquatch? Book? And it's, you know, they, he kind of just, he said, no. He said, you know, he said, I don't know what it was. He said, but it was hominid. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, so I don't know what, what all you heard up there, you know, about the different types of, different types of beings that were seen. But I, I, I'm pretty sure there's a wide variety of uh, uh, different types of, you know, beings. Uh, that they know they of course you know the guy you were with was a folklorist so i'm pretty sure he kind of brought up a few of the uh few of the uh uh, uh stories that you know are, are indigenous to the, the native people yeah and you know there's one clarification i have to make for sure because um dr robert alley at one point when i was interviewing him mentioned that he had gotten a sighting or a report of a sasquatch that was close to 15 feet tall. Now, um, we mentioned that one time, and I think that the producers uh, essentially added that to sound like all of the soft watches that are reported in Alaska, the hairy man is 15 feet tall, which is not the case at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just like here in the lower 48, the descriptions are consistent, which is very compelling, uh, but now typically about six and a half to maybe seven, eight feet tall, very broad, shouldered, muscular, hairy, no neck, long arms, you know, uh, thick, you know, basically all the same things that you hear about the Sasquatch uh, here in or Bigfoot here in the lower 48. Uh, but you know, there there have been some sightings of these Titanic, uh, Titanically tall hominids, and uh, you know, Lauren Coleman and Mark Hall has referred to them as true giants. That you know, potentially there could be something out there even bigger than Bigfoot. I don't know if that's uh, uh, how scientifically feasible that is. Uh, we know that Gigantopithecus probably stood about 10 feet tall, but I don't know if there's any evidence in the fossil history, uh, you know, or, you know, whether a hominid could, could be any taller than 10 feet and be functional. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I understand. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, maybe those are, those are eyewitness interpretations. You know, people are scared, obviously, when they, they're, when they have these encounters, their adrenaline's pumping, they're usually running away or, <laughs> and, you know, I imagine that seven, Seven, eight, maybe nine or ten feet could easily look like fifteen feet. So, uh, yeah. uh, but anyways, I just wanted to point that out. Like you said, there are sightings of you know smaller and man-sized hominids as well. But uh, the Alaskan hairy man, uh, i.e., Bigfoot or Sasquatch, is typically similar to the ones that are reported down here. Mm. I, um, you know, did you get any indication, even though uh, you know? You didn't see anything, but you got any indication from what things, what you heard from other researchers and such up there, that they uh, they are active year round, or do, is there a possibility that they hibernate sometime? Well, that that is definitely a possibility, and I think that's something that I talked about with Dr. Robert Alley. He had a lot of information. Um, you know, even there, you know, you know, here's the interesting thing. I think there's a little bit of a misconception there about hibernation with regard to bears, for example, which are, you know, probably the animals that are most associated with that behavior. Uh, bears don't typically hibernate the entire winter. They have periods where they get up and move around a little bit. Not as much. They're definitely not as active. Um, and, you know, and then there's an intermediate thing called a topor, where, you know, basically an animal just takes a really long frigging nap <laughs> yeah. days a week. If it's, you know, 30 degrees below or whatever, what's the point of going out and, and being in that? So, um, but, you know, it's really hard to say, Law. I mean, you traditionally you've always had more sightings of Bigfoot or Sasquatch during the summer, and people, some people have tried to associate that with a hibernation pattern. But on the other hand, the obvious thing is that more people are out in the woods during the summer. You know, you got more people hunting and fishing and boating and hiking, so, Absolutely. you know, they're more apt to see something. You're more apt to have more sightings under those conditions. Mm-hmm. Well, more chances for contact. Uh, you have a question? Uh, yep. 
Sean? No, go ahead, Lon. I was just making no, a I comment was, there. Yeah, I was, um, now this, this, uh, Mount Hayes area. Yeah. You, know, mm-hmm. you, <laughs> you guys, I mean, how, re- first of all, how remote is that place? Um, you know, it's, it's pretty remote. You're talking about Denali National Park. Um, it, it's, I mean, once you literally, once you start moving away from the coast in Alaska, things are, the population density, density is incredibly low. Okay. Um, you know, now we're out there in Denali. So you have people that are regular workers there year round, uh, park officers and different things like that. Guy, emergency workers, uh, some construction workers, but you know, it's a pretty remote area. Um, now, what's interesting, and I don't think we got to this in the show, is that, you know, the area around Mount Hayes, of course, traditionally a lot of UFO sightings there. Mm-hmm. We also mentioned during the show that there is a an allegation that there is an, an actual underground alien base at Mount Hayes, and this goes back to the 70s when, when our government was experimenting with remote viewing and uh, had a particular, uh, a, a particular gentleman, a, an agent, uh, I guess you'd call them that that had projected this or, or predicted this uh, alien bases under the mountain. But there are a lot of sightings around Mount Hayes, and in fact, just a few months before we got up there, uh, in the town of North Pole, Alaska, which I think is only about maybe 30 or 40 miles from Mount Hayes, uh, there was a young couple, two young women, who claimed seeing a large uh, red object um, kind of hovering over their cars. So I mean, there you know, even very recently there, there's been a lot of UFO activity in that spot. So, um, you know, I can't say that I saw any definitive evidence that there is a, a, an alien base there, but, um, you know, I suppose you could say if, uh, if aliens were going to build a base somewhere on our planet, it would probably be a pretty good spot. I mean, it's, you know, it's, there's not a lot of people out there, uh, that would see you there. There's a military base close by. And of course, I guess that's, that's the confusing thing because there's right. certainly some of those UFOs might be explained as, experimental craft or something like that well you know i thought your observations as far as the um the magnetic energy and some of the other things that you were you know actually you thought you, you had some theories about uh how the way uh <clears throat> excuse me how there were changes underneath the ice and uh you know i act you know i went back and, and looked at a, a few references when you after the show started and there, you're right. There have been some references about Mount Hayes, and in fact, I think Project Red Book even mentioned uh, an underground, a possibility of an underground base there as well. Uh, you know, I, you know, this last episode where the um, where the mountain climber just turned up missing. Uh, mm-hmm. How how frequently does that happen? Um, well, you know what? Actually happens more than you would expect. Um, right. We had a person that actually went dis- that actually went missing. Now, he wasn't a mountain climber, per se. He was kind of a hiker. Uh, he went missing uh, the last week we were up there filming, and right. it was pretty big news. Completely vanished. They couldn't find any trace of him. Uh, they had a pretty extensive search going underway. Um, the thing I've learned about Alaska is that you have a lot of people up there that are into – uh, I guess extreme adventure, kind of adrenaline junkies. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they do enjoy mountain climbing and hiking and going into extreme wilderness areas. And a lot of people do it by themselves. They don't take a buddy, which is what, what I was always taught in the Boy Scouts growing up, you know. You know you gotta, you're in the woods, make sure you got a buddy with you. You don't want to go out there in the wilderness by yourself under any circumstance. But you know, people do that. People go climbing and hiking. Now, this particular guy that disappeared, he had a partner. But I guess they had separated from some for some period of time. So, um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's a pretty treacherous place. But uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, so, some of the disappearances uh, certainly uh, very hard to explain. Yeah, I, it's raised my radar since I've seen the show because uh, I didn't realize that the activity was that high there. And uh, you know, of course, I, I knew there was a base there as well. You know, anytime you talk about Alaska and anomalies, you, you, first thing you hear about it is harp and all this other stuff. Well, I think they've yeah. torn that down now. But uh, you know, who knows? I mean, you know, there have been instances where, I, and I and I've read of instances of alien abduction, 
uh, in uh, in the in Alaska, and uh, where people swear that they were abducted, and uh, nothing really specific, but uh, uh, you know, it, it it just does sound like there's something weird going on. Now, how how was that triangle area determined? Uh, was it just because of a concentration of uh, of anomalies or missing people? in in uh, a specific area or how was it uh how was it actually determined uh, the the alaskan triangle well you know now that i have to confess i don't know exactly how how the uh the theoretical borders of the triangle how those have uh developed over time um that particular area um does have a lot of disappearances now those date back to the 1950s uh, in fact, the first episode we covered the the famous case of the missing uh, C-54 military craft uh-huh. that vanished with 46 people, a uh, serviceman aboard, and to this day they have never found any trace of the airplane or anything. And you know, after that happened, there was a fairly extensive search uh, that was undertaken. Uh, more recently, the other famous disappearance there happened in the early 1970s, uh, and that is when uh, uh, a congressman. Uh, my gosh, the name the name is eluding me at the moment. I'll see if I can. <laughs> yeah, uh, a congressman and his and uh, you know another uh, uh, one of his colleagues, I guess, that disappeared with a pilot. Three of them disappeared out there in the early seventies. And I mean, again, you're talking about a major uh, a major search that was undertaken uh, using thousands of planes and you know different you know tons of manpower or whatever. So. I didn't find anything either. So, um, so that those are the two the two disappearances that that I think received the most publicity, and I, I think the triangle was maybe formed. Uh, Hale Boggs, I'm sorry, that's what it does. He was right, the House Hale Majority Boggs. Leader. His name was Hale Boggs, right. and he was with Nick Begich, who uh, I believe was a, a senator from from Alaska, and they disappeared in in 1972. So those are the kind of the two notable disappearances. But I guess over time, somebody uh, began to, to notice that a lot of these disappearances with regard to airplanes specifically, because so many planes have disappeared, uh, kind of fell into that general area. Uh, now, the fact that it's a perfect triangle, <laughs> you know, that, that may have yeah. more to do with, with, with the Bermuda, the, the whole concept behind the Bermuda Triangle and, um, you know, going back to Ivan Sanderson and his theory about the vile vortices and all that. So Right, right. Um, but you know there there are a lot of mysteries within that triangle, and you know through the course of several episodes, we uh, you know we approach a lot of them, and they're based on Inuit legends. And uh, but you know we, we do find in many cases that there there are ongoing accounts. Did um uh now you did the experiment with the drone? I don't know which episode it was, which I thought was really interesting because you set this drone up. And you lost it while I was up there somehow. Uh, almost like you were suggesting it may have hit some type of uh, portal of some type. And then you found it another, a distance away. Uh, what did you make of that? Well, the, the disappearance was pretty perplexing. I mean, that thing shot up in the air and it just vanished from sight. I have to admit, I don't have a lot of experience with drones. Right. So uh, I, yeah, I was kind of excited. Oh, cool! We're gonna. That was our first episode that we filmed. It was just last was during off into the year, and yeah, it, it definitely vanished from sight. Um, beyond that, we did find it later on in kind of an unexpected scenario. So, uh, right. you know, pretty weird. But um, you know, again, you have to keep in mind with with you know. I think Sean put it best earlier when he was talking about how you know TV shows sometimes they. Uh, the editors have to dial things or feel like they have to dial things up a bit because <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. you have shows, and, you know, and, and the reactions were genuine. I mean, when we didn't find the drone, it was like, holy crap, you know, that's the yeah. that I was expecting to see right there. But, um, you know, there, there are, there are, I guess, uh, what I'm trying to say is that we can't dismiss possibly pragmatic reasons that things happen. And maybe we were just, you know, caught up in the excitement of the moment. But it definitely vanished from sight. And as far as us finding it later, I think that, you know, who knows? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, kind of one of those things where at the right place at the right time, you know. 
and it was it was flashing. So you know, the thing is, it looks like a UFO. It kind of flashes and pulses light, so it's it's easy to spot from a really far distance. Uh, particularly at night out there in the mountains, there's not a lot of uh, light sources out there. So, mm. um, so what can we look forward to in the next couple of episodes? You're allowed to say anything about that? Yeah, you know what? I, heck, I I'm going to do it. I don't know if I'm allowed to, but I'm going to do it. Um, no, I, I, I think they've actually appeared. I've, I've heard the descriptions appear on um, on at least one cable provider's website. So since they've, it is apparently being put out there somewhere. Um, some of the next, I'm excited. Several of the next, we have 10 episodes left uh, in season oh. one. And um, at least eight or nine of those episodes, I believe, deal with creatures, uh, legendary creatures. And, you know, uh, Alaska, of course, has a vast array of cryptids that uh, many of the people have not heard of. So um, uh, we are going to do an episode about Hark. You mentioned that a moment ago. Uh, it is true. Uh, I should say it's true. It has been claimed that Harp was shut down years ago. Um, there are some people that believe that that's not the case. There are other people that have indicated to me that they think that Harp has been replaced by a superior uh, version that's kind of top secret that people don't know about. Um, but, you know, we do talk about Harp because it is kind of an interesting uh, phenomenon uh, thing that's been going on there for a long time. And, uh, uh, I mentioned Nick, Nick Begich Jr. a moment ago, the, uh, the Alaska state senator. Well, his son, Dr. Nick Begich Jr., uh, has uh, written several books about HARP and is, is a strong advocate against HARP and, and the potential right. uh, you know, uh, backlash from, from those types of experiments. Uh, so we got him on the show, and uh, you know, we basically wanted to cover that as, as a possible reason for, you know, maybe not directly linked to, to disappearances, but... You know, you're talking about uh, essentially uh, uh, a, a giant transmitter that's beaming electromagnetic energy up into the into the ionosphere and the upper atmosphere. Well, that could have potential to cause uh, malfunctioning, you know, electronics, uh, even things like gauges and airplanes and stuff. You know, which is pretty mm-hmm. scary when you think about that kind of stuff. So we're talking about missing airplanes a few minutes ago, and now you're talking about a potential reason that airplane instrumentation could, could go uh, awry up there. Um, and then we uh, get into some of the creatures after that. Now, the first creature that we're going to tackle is called, has a number of different native names, uh, but we call it the Ixjinkok and uh, or Dinksyok. And basically, they are like diminutive, uh, almost like sinister gnome like creatures. They're described mm. as standing like three feet tall. Uh, definitely different than Bigfoot. Um, very similar to the beings that I investigated down in Central America known as the Duende, kind of like uh, magical, mystical little apparitions, but uh, they, uh, they have a very sinister side, and it is believed that they will try to abduct people and abduct children, and that's a pretty widespread um, belief up there, and it's based on, a, on an Inuit legend that's very well known. So uh, oh, we look cool. at that, with those little creatures. Um, we are also looking at, uh, directly after that, we're going to be looking at a giant cryptid canid uh, known as the Amarok, which is kind of like, uh, basically described as like a bear dog type animal, uh, apex predator, something along the lines of a, of a giant wolf or, a, uh, you know, maybe some type of uh, ancient carnivore, like a methonychid or something like that, you know, so it's just... Basically, they call it a demon wolf, but uh, again, it's kind of like a monster wolf bear kind of creature. Um, we also look at, uh, and this is an episode where my friend Nick, Nick Redfern actually was involved. We uh, look at sightings of basically snow monkeys. Uh, up there, there is a legend of the Katani, which are described as the tailed ones or the tailed men. Uh, well, the, the, the modern descriptions of those that we dug up, basically people have described these, uh, again, very different from Bigfoot. Uh, these are essentially uh, uh, monkeys, uh, you know, kind of large, vicious, uh, tailed monkeys that, lived in, that live in caves. Um, and, you know, not that dissimilar from some of the large monkey species that you have in Asia, but again, uh, repeatedly very vicious, very hostile and aggressive towards people. 
um, and of a very high intelligence. So those are some of the creatures that we have coming up. And then after that, we have some, we get into some aquatic cryptids and some other things uh, on the final uh, few episodes. Um, are any of these creatures that you described uh, lane for missing persons? Uh, well, that's, you know, that, that's basically what we we're trying to investigate, right. that line of right. thinking. Is there a potential that people could be falling prey, I guess, falling victim to some of these highly aggressive creatures, cryptids out here? Um, you know, the, you know uh, Sean was talking about uh, David Polites earlier, of course. Everyone is very familiar with his research and his theory. Right. It's kind of groundbreaking. Um, you know, there are prevalent uh, legends with regard to the, the Alaskan hairy man that they are, uh, you know, basically that they do abduct humans. And, you know, if you consider the, some of the famous accounts that we have in Sasquatch lore, the, the alleged abduction of uh, prospector Albert Ostman in British Columbia, you know, kidnapped by a family of Sasquatches and held <laughs> prisoner for several days. Uh, there, are similar, there are similar stories from up there in, you know, in Alaska. Even a very uh, recent story, uh, a young Native woman who claimed that she was uh, abducted and held by a family of Sasquatches. So we're kind of following that line of thinking. Could, could people up uh, in Alaska be either potentially uh, falling victim, being abducted or kidnapped by intelligent, you know, hominid-type beings? Or, you know, could they be potentially victimized and, you know, are they being killed by or, or falling prey to some of these other uh, cryptids, which are... Uh, you know, at least according to descriptions, uh, very intimidating, <laughs> very scary. Uh, we had a question in the chat room. Uh, is there any evidence to show that uh, there's a distance of missing people either during the day or in the evening? Uh, is it is there a preference? Um, you know, that's an interesting question. But you know, if you if you've been to Alaska, you realize that half the year it's a whole lot of night not a lot of yeah. day and the other half of the year it's pretty much all day with no night so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, literally let's put know, it this it, way uh when you know when the seasons are more light and the seasons are more dark is uh is, is one uh seem to uh have more missing persons than the other uh, you know, I, I don't think we ever did break that down, so I, I can't give yeah. you a, a really good, you know, it's a great question, but um, <clears throat> I would assume that more people by far would go missing during the winter months, uh, you know, because it, it is pretty treacherous. I mean, you're talking about uh, wind chills that can get down to ridiculously low, negative 30, negative 40. Now, most people that live in Alaska are acclimated to that and prepared for that, mm -hmm. but situations do arise where you know, people are, aren't prepared, and, uh, you know, that could definitely lead to dire circumstances. Mm. Well, Sean, you have anything? Well, yeah, we spent a lot of time talking about Alaska, and, and of course, you know, rightfully so with Michigan, Alaska. But what, uh, what have you been focusing on in the lower 48, Ken? Anything interesting coming up in this uh, in this area? Huh. Well, um, yeah, actually, I, I just um, finished a manuscript for a, for a new book. Um, it won't be released until next year, but uh, it's going to be with Llewellyn Publishing, and it's uh, titled uh, A Menagerie of Mysterious Beasts. And uh, it's kind of a, a potpourri or a mixture of different uh, creatures that I've either investigated or, uh, you know, lots of reports and accounts that I've collected over the past several years. Um you know, there's some really interesting things in there. You know, uh, we do, uh, I do a chapter on the Minnesota Iceman, which of course is a, a topic that's near and dear to my, and probably a lot of Bigfooters hearts, but, uh, I had the opportunity to see the, the resurfacing, so to speak, of the Minnesota Iceman a couple of years ago. And I was involved in, uh, I remember that kind of yeah. the lights. Uh, it's actually, uh, right now it's on display at Lauren Coleman's, uh, International Cryptozoology Museum up there in Portland, Maine. So if there's anyone in the Northeast who wants to see the Minnesota Iceman, it's a, it's a great opportunity to see that. I uh, also wrote a chapter about, uh, you know, kind of strange hominids. Thunderbirds, of course, always a huge focus of my research, and I've collected many, many Thunderbird accounts that have never been published over the past few years. People that have come forward, that have really had the courage to come forward and share their experiences. Uh, lots of living pterodactyl reports, uh, some sea monsters, 
Uh, and then some really weird, like, you know, some giant amphibians and uh, uh, giant insects and, you know, creepy crawlies and even kind of some spectral apparition type things that are, you know, kind of up Lawn's Alley there. So uh, so that book should be out next year. And I've uh, um, been working on that one for quite a while. And then, you know, right now I'm just kind of uh, uh, gearing up for the Mothman Festival, which you mentioned. I'll be speaking there on the... On the 19th and 20th up in Point Pleasant. I'm real excited to be up there for the first time. And um, we also have a, a, a Texas Bigfoot conference coming up in October uh, shortly after that. So uh, those are the main things I'm working on right now. But uh, I have some potential investigations uh, that are in the kind of early planning stages. But we're just going to kind of see how it goes. Mm. Well, you yeah, keep busy. Pretty, I, yeah, I'm going to be interested in that book. Uh, that sounds interesting because uh, – well, you know, I, I'm I always enjoy new stories, or uh, you know, new sightings that have never I mean, or even old sightings that have never been, you know, put out there before. And uh, yeah, that that sounds very interesting. Of course, I'll definitely be getting that. Yeah, for sure, Lon. And you know, I think it's a I'll, I'll make sure you have a copy of the way, brother, because I think it is important that all of us, you know, kind of in this field and investigate these weird creature reports, cryptids, or whatever. You know, it is important that we have a free exchange of information and sightings. And Lon has always, Lon has always been awesome in terms of sending me uh, links or sightings to, to things that he, you know, he thinks might be of interest to me in my research. And uh, you know, I've I've kind of been keeping these uh, on the down low while I've been writing the book. But as soon as the book is out, I want I want to get those reports out there because you never know when you're going to connect the dots. Isn't right. that right, Lon? And that's one of the exciting parts about investigating this stuff is when you start realizing that uh, you get corroborating reports from different people or, you know, one particular area starts producing a lot of sightings. So, um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, kind of kind of new reports uh, that are going to be in the book that are pretty cool. Well, maybe one day we'll ring the bell some. Or <laughs> maybe start connecting some of the, you know, I, I've always thought that there's a fine line between much of you know the paranormal supernatural cryptozoology uh that there may be a connection and most likely there is a connection though it's not something we're actually seeing at the moment but you know we're theorizing a lot of things you know and and you know some of the information you know, has has kind of brought a few things to light i feel over the years and recently yeah and uh mm -hmm. you know it's some pretty neat stuff it really is it's a good time to be in cryptozoology. Absolutely. You know, I'm very encouraged by the, the, the show of interest and support in, uh, you know, in lots of different pursuits that I've been involved in. And, you know, what's really cool, guys, is I get – lately I've been getting a lot of messages or emails from young people that are in high school or junior high, and they want to know how to become a cryptozoologist or they're writing a paper on the subject or something. And, you know, we – let me just say, I think the future's in good hands because, I mean, these young people today, they really have a lot of good information, and they know their stuff, but they really do. So, I mean, uh, yeah. it's going to be exciting, and uh, it's it's cool that, you know, we've got a generation of, of young monster hunters coming up. Yeah, I, I'm I'm also encouraged by that as well because I do get a lot of uh, inquiries from, you know, from the young folks, and uh, that's, that's great. I mean, you know. Yep. I've actually got a lot of readers that are young, you know, in the blog. So, absolutely. So, Sean, you got uh, you got anything else? You I always got about? something. I'm always I'm always excited and, and ready to talk cryptozoology. But one thing I had to give Ken credit for is that a lot of people call themselves cryptozoologists. But uh -huh. can you really walk the walk uh, when you do this? I mean, you know, just listening to you and, and all the topics you tackle, tackle, we have to commend you on, on what you do, getting out there and investigating and exploring all these different cryptozoological creatures. But I guess my question is, when do you find the time? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, there's always, uh, yeah, that's, that's a struggle because, I've got, you know, particularly now because I have a lot of uh, – people around the country that are involved in different investigations and groups and uh, uh, they're keeping me in the loop. And I'm, I, you know, I'm always interested in following other people's, uh, you know, research and seeing what they're coming up with. But, uh, you know, I always have invitations to come join people in the field and travel different places. And I, unfortunately I just 
you know, a lot of those I just haven't been able to do lately. So that's been kind of discouraging. But um, kind of backpedaling for just a second, Sean, I really appreciate your kind words. It was very nice of you to say. I want to rewind to, to much earlier in the show when Lon was asking me about the, the, the bipedal canids, the, the quote-unquote dog man. Cryptozoology, of course, is based on, you know, actual zoology. And I think that as much as we like to or tend to get into kind of these romantic notions with regard to these creatures, and it is true that some of these things may be, you know, spectral or metaphysical, we don't know. You know, looking at something like a dog man, you have to approach it from a zoological perspective first, I think. And, you know, there is really no evidence that a canid would have adapted bipedalism as a primary mode of locomotion. You know, what what benefit would it have at that point? There's no evidence of that in the fossil history. So, you know, that, that's one of the things that's kind of like I have I kind of have my my little folder over here to the side where I have the the, the dog man and the flying humanoids and the goat men and the mermaids and all those kind of weird zoo form creatures tossed away. And then, you know, the primary focus of, of cryptozoology has always been and should continue to be uh, species that are viable, you know, and I think something like Bigfoot is viable. You have giant hominids that lived, you know, we know for a fact they lived hundreds of thousands of years ago in China. Who's to say they didn't make it over here? You have all kinds of monstrous marine saurians and giant, you know, archaic whales. Who's to say that some of those couldn't live, still live in the ocean and be viable sea monsters, you know, quote unquote sea monsters, things like that? Thunderbirds, you know, thunderbirds match with actual, an actual fossil form, the pterosaurs, these giant raptor like birds that lived during the Pleistocene. So you have a lot of cryptids that are actually, from a scientific perspective, you know, there's a lot of potential there. And then the fun part of cryptozoology and, and monster hunting is you have this folder, the folder off to the side with the kind of the really the weird stuff <laughs> that you can't wrap your head around. Yeah. Um, but you still you can still investigate it, you know, because there's still you know there's still questions there, and it's a, it's a line of evidence that you have to pursue either way. So. Well, you know, the, the thing that's most fascinating to me about some people seeing the weird stuff is a lot of these sightings, if not most of these sightings come from people that have no idea what cryptozoology is. And, yep. you know, you, you talk to them and they, you know, they don't know, you know, they actually do not know what they saw. And that's the great thing. Now, do, does their imagination kind of get a hold of them? Well, that's what you got to determine. You know, did they kind of embellish on it because of the shock value, you know, of seeing this thing? But I don't, think that's, but I don't. I don't think that's a big part of it. You know, they actually think they see these things, and yeah. I think for the most part they get they get the information right. Yeah, well, you know that's the thing, Ron, is You can't disprove it, and you know yeah. I, I for one never really want to question someone's uh, testimony or personal experience. You know, I do interview a lot of people that have had remarkable experiences with things that I can't explain. And you, you can't question their, their sincerity. I mean, they really, you know, there, there's almost like a, a post-traumatic stress that, that develops after some of these, these encounters. So I guess the question comes down to, is, is it something that is, is like a, an ultra-terrestrial intelligence? Are we talking about something that's either coming here through a doorway from another dimension, as some people like to say, or manifesting um, – somehow supernaturally or is it or or are these phenomena are they projected from us as individuals is it something right. that we create deep in the recesses of our mind and then somehow project onto the fabric of our reality our paradigm and that would explain for example why why we have this whole rash of dogman sightings right it's almost like mm -hmm. people are giving giving the dogman life now somehow it's kind of a weird phenomenon but you know it could be either or but uh, you know i don't doubt that people are having these experiences it's just you know so far out there that it's really hard to, to you know to find answers do you think there's still room in, in this field uh, and, and i guess i'll step back a moment and just clarify what i'm going to ask it you know connecting the cryptozoological let, let's say the bigfoot to uh 
you know, more of a uh, para paranormal uh, aspect, you know, disappearing wormholes, that that sort of deal. And we've been battling sure. this for a long time in, in the in the Bigfoot realm. And there's always been that tug of war between the flesh and blood flo- folk and the uh, paranormal believers. Is there room mm-hmm. still for that for both those sides to exist? Is there is there a way for there to be some sort of, you know, meshing together that maybe we are looking at completely different? Uh, entities maybe we're looking at completely different uh, uh, beings in itself I mean we don't have the answers to all these questions we we don't have a whole lot of real evidence uh, you know to prove these things exist besides what we believe to be evidence and you know is there room for these two perspectives to still coexist with one another wow that's a great question you know Sean I have to say it, it's in my opinion, it's probably getting harder and harder for, for us to have that kind of harmonious <laughs> existence, uh, coexistence in, in the Bigfoot world, for example. Um, and the reason is, is that it's very, I think it's very difficult for all humans, all people, to detach themselves from their emotions and their belief systems and be you know, purely objective and look at things you know, very skeptically and objectively. I think you have some people that are very, very much, they, they almost become believers. It almost becomes like a, like a religion. Like they want to believe their particular theory or, you know, belief, uh, you know, with regard to these creatures so bad that they start rejecting evidence that, that might conflict with that. You know what I'm saying? And um, it's a very polarizing topic. Uh, you know, even in terms of, you know, let's just subtract the, the paranormal aspect of Bigfoot for a moment. There's been this ongoing debate for years and years of whether big, if Bigfoot exists, is it more of like a hominid? Is it, is it a man-like form? Is it closely related to us? Are they, some people are even calling them the forest people now? Or is it simply a big lumbering ape, you know, some type of anthropoid or, or pongid, you know, that basically has learned how to walk upright like we do? You know, so, and, and, and those two arguments actually touch on people's religious belief systems because you have people that are devoutly religious that don't want to accept the fact that there are other quote unquote human species or human like forms. And, you know, on the other side, you have people that are purely scientific that, you know, don't want to accept, you know, A, B, and C, you know, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, it's, it, it, I think that's the problem is people are very, these, these, uh, these are supercharged subjects that we investigate and it's very easy to get sucked in and for people to become emotionally attached to their theory their belief well, it's very political now yeah so i would like to think that we could we could all be open-minded but um you know and, and and maybe lean a little bit either direction but i just don't know if that's possible anymore well, it took me 20 years to admit there might be something to habituation, so I don't know. I guess maybe <laughs> over time people can change. And I guess that's okay for people to realize you can change your opinion over time. You know, the more you open your mind, the more you read, you know, you can. It's okay to change your mind on things uh, as more becomes apparent. But I guess for me, you know, personally speaking, that uh, I'm still a little hesitant to admit there might be something paranormal to these creatures. Lon, you know that. We talk about it every sure. every week. Uh, but there's definitely, there's some cryptids out there that I'm okay saying that are flesh and blood. For me, I still believe Bigfoot's a flesh and blood creature. But there are some other entities out there that I just can't nail down. I can't put my, uh, I can't put my finger on it and say, you know what? That's what it is. We got these flying rays for crying out loud that I have no idea what they are. But nope. Uh, people are seeing them, and and some of these people are are very honest. And and again, on the show, we've talked many times. You can tell when you're interviewing and talking to somebody that you know firmly believes that this is what they seen, or they really saw what they what they believe they did, or that they've convinced themselves so so uh, strongly that there's no shaking. You know that this is what they believe they saw. This is really interesting what we do, and the way people tell stories, their body language is incredible. And I was talking to Lon about that before we got on the show. When there were gentlemen talking on uh, Missing in Alaska, the one thing I noticed about you, Ken, is you paid an awful lot of attention to the person talking, uh, sharing their experience. Like you're kind of studying them to pick up on what they were uh, kind of projecting. Is that something you believe in, too? Do you really believe in the body language and the physical tells? Absolutely. And, um, you know, one one of my... 
podcast when someone contacts me is, you know, if we have a phone interview, you know, I try to get to know that person as much as possible. But, you know, moreover, there will be follow-up phone calls where I'll call the, the same eyewitness randomly maybe three months later and ask him the same questions all over again just to see if, if you have that that consistency, you know, that's a, that, that can be pretty compelling. When someone tells you the same exact experience over and over again, you know, with every detail being, you know, perfectly aligned, uh, as opposed to people that tend to be a little bit more esoteric and, you know, perhaps, you know, things, things the, the details are changing slightly or embellishing gradually each time, you know, just unfortunately you have to cast a, a more of a skeptical uh form more of a skeptical opinion about those types of people. So, yeah, but you're right. I mean, you can learn a lot about somebody by, you know, looking in their eyes, reading their body language, trying to understand maybe their uh, their experience, their life experience, to, to, you know, the best of your ability and so forth. So, um, uh, but that's also, you know, that being said, one of the truly rewarding aspects of what I do, and I feel very blessed to, to have the opportunity to pursue these uh, different mysteries is, you know, getting to meet the people and getting to know them and trying to understand their experience. Um, you know, and, and I think there's a reverse side effect there, which is, you know, oftentimes these are people that uh, they, they've had experiences that they can't explain, uh, that have shaken the foundation of their reality, that, you know, they're, they're afraid to talk, you know, to their spouses or their best friends, you know, because they, they don't want to be, you know, criticized or looked, up, looked upon in a funny way. So, you know, a lot of times by giving them an outlet, someone to talk to and providing, you know, maybe additional accounts that correspond with it, you know, you can, you can maybe provide a little bit of closure. I guess, does that make sense what I'm saying? It's almost oh, it like makes a lot of sense. Therapy. Definitely. You know, Lon, Lon probably knows what I'm talking about, too, because I'm sure oh, you've you provided that to a lot of people, you know. So if someone says that they've seen a dog man and, you know, they, they, they may feel uncomfortable about talking about it, but then you, you go through your files and you find out that someone saw that exact same dog man two months earlier, 30 miles away. You know what I'm saying? And then you give them that information and you're like, look, I don't know what you saw, but look at this. <laughs> you know? Again, it's about connecting the dots and that stuff happens. It's pretty fun. Oh yeah. It's, uh, it's been gratifying. You know, people ask me, well, how can you write that blog every day? Or how can you do this? I mean, if I didn't love it, I didn't, I wouldn't be doing it. Guarantee it. I mean, I'm not making no money off of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's uh, it's something that's uh, it kind of gets stuck in your psyche, and you know, it's something you got to do. Yeah, I guess it's yeah. like a drug to me. I guess that's I okay. Yeah, you know, I want to know the truth. I want to know what's out there. You know, uh, if if I happen to be lucky enough to figure something out someday, then well, that's that's great. But you know. I, you know, I, I just like this, you know, and I think, and I, I think the one thing about the, the crypto uh, community is th that overall, I think most people, most people that do this do share a lot of the information. And yeah. uh, I, I've been really, I've been really heartened by that. Uh, you know, you see it all the time and I, I think that's great. And uh, that's, that can't do anything but help what we do. So, um, Hey man, all the power to you, Ken. I, I I really do, I really do appreciate what you do. And uh, hey, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, th this was great. I, I'm glad we got you on. And uh, I know the listeners are are really thrilled about listening to what you uh, what you go through and the, the new show and uh, and that you got a new book coming. Uh, can, how can people get a hold of you? Well, um. First of all, thanks for having me on again, guys. This is an awesome experience. Um, great questions, and uh, thanks to everyone in the chat room, everyone that listened in, because I, I think this was this is definitely a lot of fun, and uh, I appreciate it. And um, I would, uh, as far as getting in touch with me, um, I have a website, kengerhard.com. Uh, it's a kind of a work in progress, but there's a way to to, to link with my email in there. Uh, I also have a Facebook fan page, Ken Gerhard Cryptozoologist, and uh, uh, if you message me on there, I'll do my very best to uh, to respond in a timely manner. And uh, yeah, I would love to hear from anyone out there that has any questions or comments, or you know, if your uncle saw Sasquatch back in 1978, <laughs> you know, whatever. I mean, man, I, I just love to hear this 
So I love to hear all of the accounts, and I love to connect with people. So uh, give me a shout. <laughs> well, absolutely. I mean, we got to get you back on, especially since your new books are coming out. And uh, I'm quite sure we're going to have a lot of questions for you. So, um, Ken, thanks for joining us, man. And, and thanks for reconsidering coming back after the cancellation. But, uh, you know, it, it's really good. It's really good to have talked to you again. And, uh, you know, you and I will keep in touch. And, you know, I, I just want to I just really want to thank you. So much appreciated. Uh, Sean, thank you so much. You're great, gracious producer and host, very knowledgeable as always. And Our pleasure. And Lon, thank you so much, brother. Give my best to Vanessa, and uh, I love you, man. Please, uh, please do stay in touch. Take care now. Thanks again. All right. Thanks, guys. Good Thanks, night, Ken. Bye. Great show tonight, there, Lon. Uh, great to have Ken on the program. Very knowledgeable, like you said. Uh, just a good guy. I, I enjoy having uh, being able to talk to Ken. Uh, we had him on Beyond the Edge Radio a while back. Uh, yeah. Love having him on Arcane Radio. This was a great opportunity. Uh, glad we could finally have him on, even though we had that little technical glitch. We got through it. <laughs> we got through it pretty well. So here's the deal, yeah. folks. <laughs> yeah, it didn't blow up on us anyway. But you know, no, it's it. Yeah, I I, I always I always like talking to Ken, and you know, I some of the stuff he does. And his books have been outstanding. And, uh, I mean, he's, he's a true researcher and he, you know, he's, um, I'm not going to say one of a kind, but he is basically almost what well, you say one of a kind. He's, he, he's just a great crypto researcher. And he does it. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's like I said, he, he, he doesn't does just he doesn't just talk the talk he walks the walk and I think that's really important especially today when you have so many people claiming to be so many things and when you can talk to somebody who actually does what they say they do phenomenal yeah. oh, and, yeah. and and we need to be celebrating and pushing those folks even further into the forefront to represent uh, cryptozoological research in a good way and that that's fantastic in my book and the fact that he came on the show and was able to uh, do this with us tonight just awesome good guy Ken and we're glad to have him on the program and we'll have him about on again too uh, so here's the deal with tonight's show I know we had a little technical difficulties and we apologize for that uh, we're getting better every week though we're having less technical difficulties tonight wasn't us I promise wasn't me I didn't hit any buttons it just did its own thing. So what we're going to do is in a couple, it's probably going to take a couple days. So I'm going to have to splice this together and I'm not off again until Wednesday. So Wednesday I'll sit down and I'll put this together. We'll get it up on the, uh, up on Stitcher. And, uh, so you folks can go through and if you would, please go through, if you listen to our show, you like our show every week, go to the Stitcher radio, search arcane radio, or just go to our website, arcane click on the Stitcher button and uh, it'll take you to our Stitcher page and, and review us because that gives us, that's our report card. That's you telling us how we're doing. And, and we appreciate that feedback. And we take that feedback and really try to make the show better for you each and every week. And that involves a little participation. We need your questions. We need your guest suggestions because other than that, it's just Lon and I doing our thing and you guys just get to listen. We want this show to be for you because that's why we do this every week. Trust me. Mm. There's other things we could do on Monday night, but we love doing this, and we want to make this a great experience, not just every other podcast that's out there, a great experience for you. And I'm just happy to be a part of this, Lon, and uh, you know, we've really taken something. We've been on the air a year now. Uh, we've taken something small, built it to something better. Who knows how big we'll get? We don't look at that as an end goal, at least I don't, and I know you know we don't look at this to be anything more than this labor of love that we do because we love the world of the paranormal, the strange, the unexplained. That's it. That's it. Uh, so next week, we got another crypto researcher coming on, uh, Boggy Creek fame. Uh, Lyle Blackburn's going to be with us. Uh, his most recent book, well, about a year, last year, or 2013, was The uh, Bishopville Monster. And wow, that was a big one. That was very well written uh, about the uh, the lizard the lizard humanoid in Bishopville, South Carolina. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to review that book. And, oh, it was fantastic. I, I called it the crypto book of 2013. So I look forward to, to Lyle joining us next week. And we got a lot to talk about. 
definitely. We're going to be going till the end of October. Then we're going to be taking a break over uh, November, December, probably the first week of January, and we'll come back with uh, even more shows. We've got a couple things in the work that might change the way uh, you experience Arcane Radio in terms of uh, what we're going to be doing for commercial breaks because we do need to go to the bathroom every once in a while. The longer we take these shows the and the older we get, the the more we have to go to the bathroom. Uh, so yeah. we got to have something to play in the interim, and I don't want to get sued for playing music. So uh, we're trying to figure something out here, folks. Uh, like I said, always a work in progress uh, for you, and we're not going to rest until it's the absolute best, and that rhymed unintentionally. But I guess until next week, we do have Lyle Blackburn on the show. Uh, Y'all be safe, keep it real, love each other, and don't do anything stupid. All I, all I can do is ditto that. You take care now. Good night, everybody. See you next week.